This is my real pleasure to introduce you to Professor Shalini Randeria, who is Rector of the Central European University in Vienna and also a Professor of Anthropology and Sociology at the Graduate Institute and the founder of the Democracy Center, the Albert Hirschman Democracy Center. Uh, we are very pleased that you accepted to tell us uh, about your thoughts about uh, one of the big issues uh, that we are actually discussing in this current volume of Global Challenges, the issue of decolonization and how different disciplines have historically thought about decolonization but also participated in uh, decolonizing uh, knowledge and politics. Shalini Andrea, thank you very much for being here. My first question is uh, about the priorities uh, set for academia in the context of all these social movements uh, that have uh, um, uh, given rise to the topic of decolonizing knowledge in the recent period, from Black Lives Matter to Roads Must Fall, different institutions, not only institutions of higher learning, have reflected on the legacies of colonialism. So could you tell us what you see as being the priorities for academics and scholars today? Well, uh, Gregor, I think we should take a step back uh, because uh, I think um, uh, Black Lives Matter or Roads Must Fall are the latest um, iterations mm -hmm. of a call for decolonization of knowledge production but also of Western institutions of uh, higher learning. I think uh, if we want to um, look at some of the um, um, kinds of disciplinary knowledge that I'm most familiar with coming from India, uh, already in the 1930s and 40s, we have had economists in India um, pointing to the really um, detrimental effects of uh, colonialism on the Indian economy. So producing knowledge which is very different uh, from a different vantage point, but also knowledge which is very different from the economic knowledge being produced um, in the West on uh, that topic. If you want to look outside of academia, then you have very early uh, somebody like Gandhi uh, writing on the very pernicious effects of colonialism, imperialism. Interestingly, not only on the colonized, but equally on those who colonized. Uh, so thinking of both sides of the relationship. Think of someone like Franz Fanon, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, said very famously, uh, Europe is a creation of its colonies. Mm -hmm. um, so we have had many precursors who have given us ideas about what um, decolonizing uh, knowledge uh, would mean, how it would mean setting uh, Euro-America in a relationship um, um, an asymmetrical relationship, but nevertheless a uh, very um, uh, strong um, uh, relationship with uh, the rest of the world, uh, which they colonized at different times to different um, uh, degrees. And therefore, of course, the decolonization, and I think we really should have it in the plural, it is about mm -hmm. decolonizations because they proceeded uh, at a different pace and at different times in uh, different parts of the Global South. So Latin America uh, was of course colonized earlier and decolonized um, much earlier. So if we think however of a long tradition in Latin America, someone like um, Andy Gunda Frank with the seminal essay, The Development of Underdevelopment, mm -hmm. Dependencia Theory, we have a theoretician there uh, who has been pointing to these links um, as well. And then, interestingly, we have an absolute silence on the Western side. So think of the classical sociologists, you're in my discipline, Weber, who is certainly interested in the non-Western world and has studied all the religious thought in other parts of the world, not a word on imperialism. Durkheim, not cognizant of imperialism, Zimmel, doesn't take any notice of imperialism. So we look at French theory, British theory, um, German theory on, in sociology, and the absolute glaring absence is any theorization of um, colonialism or imperialism. And this continues up to uh, the modern um, uh, thinkers. So look at Habermas's work or um, uh, Luhmann, uh, Giddens, 
uh, Bauman in England um, and uh, think of uh, someone like Foucault. So there is a continual absence uh, there. So I think we, it's, it's time one begins to take uh, note of these absences mm -hmm. and to see how different disciplines have dealt very differently uh, with these legacies. Uh, so that's one part of the question. The other is, of course, what is the impact which these two movements, Roads Must Fall and Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, have had. And both, interestingly, uh, Roads Must Fall is earlier mm -hmm. and starts in South Africa. And it's not just a call for uh, decolonizing mm -hmm. uh, knowledge. It is a call for very different institutional access to those who's, um, mm, uh, who are marginalized, who have been denied even entry to these institutions because of inadequate uh, or, or the way the resources are unevenly distributed. But they're also asking very much for other voices and other experiences to be heard in academia. So I think there is a whole set of issues that one needs to address simultaneously. Thank you very much. It's interesting that uh, when you uh, cited examples of thinkers uh, uh, who uh, try to advocate for uh, decolonization, you cited a lot of economists, uh, from the economists of uh, uh, underdevelopment from the dependency theory, or psychiatrists uh, like Franz Fanon. Uh, these theorists have, in some sense, uh, been uh, used by anthropologists and sociologists, but they do not come from these two disciplines. Uh, can you think of thinkers who originate from either sociology or, thro or anthropology who have participated in uh, developing concepts that could be useful for decolonization uh, either from the 30s or the 70s? Uh, or do you think these two disciplines, as you say, have a problem because they are somehow blind to the issue of colonialism, which is how you uh, uh, said was the case of, for instance, Weber or Foucault, for whom uh, this is not a historical fact they are really uh, uh, thinking through. So this is an interesting question. I could give you um, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, and I put slash anthropologists, I come to that in a moment, why, um, from India, mm -hmm. who are uh, someone like Radha Kamal Mukherjee, they are mm -hmm. thinking in the um, uh, 30s, uh, 40s, uh, very much about a different kind of uh, knowledge production. There are also, interestingly, Indian philosophers who are also thinking um, about uh, what it means uh, to think outside of the West mm -hmm. and to think about philosophical traditions which are both their own, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, were actually untouched by Western traditions originally, and also what it is to think in this uh, relationality. So we do have uh, that uh, for sure. They didn't affect the canon of anthropological mm -hmm. and sociological thinking. But interestingly, neither in India nor in the West. And mm -hmm. that's something one needs to think about. What does it mean to institutionalize knowledge in a particular way? And how powerful that institutionalization has been in the West and how that itself gets transferred and globalized to the rest of the world, that institutionalization. And that, for example, just take the difference between anthropology and sociology as disciplines, right? So here, uh, I remember uh, when I was a graduate student in um, uh, Delhi, uh, one of the textbooks I came across in anthropology, John Beatty's book, it's called Other Cultures. Right. So there is, as Edward Said rightly pointed mm -hmm. out in Orientalism, there is a basic premise of there being an ontological and an epistemological difference between us and them, and I mm -hmm. point to myself here as them, mm -hmm. because it's always about the Western um, observer's gaze, anthropological mm -hmm. gaze, of the other, and the other is somebody far away, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's Sociology is the knowledge of one's own society, mm -hmm. right? So the distinction has always been one of the distinction is predicated on a distinction between the West and the rest. So sociology, political science, economics, all disciplines um, have as their objects 
the uh, modern nation state or the modern polity, modern society, modern economy, uh, and modern being restricted then to Euro America. And then we take off parts of America, which are uh, then Native Americans. They don't belong to sociology. They mm -hmm. should belong to anthropology. Just as here in um, Western Europe, you will take away parts which then belong to ethnology the um, mountain villages, mm -hmm. alpine villages in Switzerland, they don't belong to sociology, mm -hmm. they belong to a different discipline. But the disciplinary division of labor is an imperial division mm -hmm. of labor here. And uh, I, I'll, I, I'm just reminded um, of my coming to Heidelberg as a PhD student and wanting to do a PhD on uh, India and uh, on family law in India and went to the sociology department and they received me with uh, interest. I'd come with an Oxford uh, MPhil in sociology. But when they looked at my topic, they said, well, is this really a topic for sociology? India is not really modern enough to be an object of sociological analysis. Maybe you should go to the anthropologists. So I go to the Department of Anthropology and they look at this topic and say, well, family law and law courts in India, you know, but this is not primitive enough to be an object of analysis for anthropology because it looks at Papua New Guinea and it looks at the Amazonian Indians. So you have a division of labor in which China, India, um, or even uh, the Islamic uh, uh, civilizations of the modern East, uh, of the Middle East, uh, have no place uh, in this binary division of labor. So these are the disciplines in Western academia which are philological disciplines, so sinology, mm -hmm. Indolo Indology, uh, uh, um, Arabic studies or Persian studies. So there is this strange division of labor which has got institutionalized and that's why I'm so glad that uh, both at CEU and here at the Graduate Institute, two departments that I was privileged to build, I very strongly insisted the department should overcome this distinction. It is a study which is a comparative study of modern societies and I think that's where we should stand. So your question however is who are the anthropologists who help us think through mm -hmm. this? So I think the early work here is uh, Talal Asad's book, mm -hmm. uh, Anthropology and the Colonial um, uh, Encounter, late in that sense, mid-70s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is where uh, the discussion uh, begins. It's a complicated relationship between anthropology and uh, colonialism. It's not a really straightforward one as one would imagine, mm -hmm. because as Wendy James's essay uh, has a very interesting uh, phrase in Talal Asad's book, she says anthropologists were reluctant imperialists. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, on the one hand close to the people whom they are studying because they were supposed to look at the native's point of view. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, they are not really part of the imperial administration, although much of the knowledge that they are producing can be of use and was made use of by uh, the imperial administration in many parts of the world, Africa, India, uh, etc. The other person whose work comes to mind and who, um, for my own um, uh, intellectual uh, biography, apart from Edward Said, who was uh, very, very influential for me, was Johannes Fabian, mm -hmm. his book Time and the Other. Mm -hmm. I think that was a seminal contribution to anthropology, which is idea that uh, there is a denial of what he calls coevalness. Uh, uh, Gleichzeitigkeit uh, in German. So it is a denial of people sharing the same time as you. Mm -hmm. They share the same space, but they don't share the same time because you invert the geographical distance into a time axis in which you say those societies are primitive, underdeveloped, mm -hmm. all in um, inverted commas, but basically you say they are somehow temporarily behind us. Mm -hmm. So it is that denial which lies at the base of this kind of uh, division, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for a very rich answer. I, I would like to, to pick up one thread that, that you touched upon, which is uh, the, the answer to the question of how do we move forward. And, and uh, you cited at the beginning that we should uh, have uh, more voices enter the canon of our discipline. So each discipline could be more inclusive and more uh, pay attention to 
uh, who participated in the elaboration of the methods, the epistemologies. Um, and another uh, way of thinking uh, about how we should decolonize discipline is to question the notion of discipline itself. And you already mentioned the imperial division of labor between sociology and anthropology uh, uh, as, uh, as basically being an obstacle in uh, when you uh, uh, were a young PhD student. And so I was wondering if today you think these, uh, the disciplines can go by decolonizing themselves alone from within, or is it the whole disciplinary division of labor and the boundaries between disciplines that should be redrawn? I think both would be necessary because as long as these disciplinary tribes exist, mm -hmm. uh, then the tribe has to change its culture as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's about uh, the kinds of norms, the kinds of um, uh, customs uh, mm -hmm. which each of these disciplines as a tribe has. Uh, the publication standards, uh, the division it creates, the way in which it polices the boundaries of the tribe, um, uh, that needs to be uh, rethought. So I think there has to be a process which is within uh, the discipline. But I think that's not enough. I, this is why I said that I really think one needs to rethink a lot of the disciplinary boundaries. And for me, the major one would be between sociology and anthropology. Uh, and also then, as I said, the other sub-boundary here in uh, Europe in particular about anthropology and European anthropology, <laughs> right? So that is also a relic of this threefold or fourfold division, which I just um, uh, mentioned. So I think uh, uh, if we really are interested in a comparative uh, study of um, modern societies, um, then we need to rethink those disciplinary boundaries. Um, the interesting thing uh, here, uh, I think, would be uh, to think differently in terms of, so, or, or let me put it a di in a different way. Um, if you uh, remember Salman Rushdie's um, uh, character, Viski Sisodia, mm -hmm. he has a very interesting uh, line when he says, uh, the British know so little about their own history because most of it happened overseas. Right? So it's also about not just rethinking disciplinary boundaries, in that case mm -hmm. between British history or European history and imperial history, which in England is a very strong disciplinary division mm -hmm. or subdivision within the discipline of history, but it's also about rethinking the geographies mm -hmm. um, that uh, we inhabit and also mentally inhabit, right? Because as uh, Stuart Hall, who coined the term the West and the rest, reminded us, Japan is always an honorary member of the Western Club. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if there's a real mapping of mm -hmm. uh, geography on our mental mapping of these uh, geographies. So one way to think about this would be, and that is what I tried to do with the idea of entangled histories, which when I wrote my first piece on this in 1999, is to say um, there are three tendencies which we need to uh, somehow transcend. One is sociologists uh, idea of a universal embrace of the other. Mm -hmm. So everybody is subsumed under Western universalism. The other is this reflects, the absolutely the other reflex, which is to say, each is absolutely distinct and on its own. And this is a reflex which um, in some um, ways can, uh, you know, uh, cultural relativism carried to its extreme mm -hmm. can lead to. The uh, problem with that reflex is not only, I mean, there are very good parts to cultural relativism because if we look at its historical um, genesis, it is a way of valorizing um, other cultures as valuable on its own mm -hmm. and not as always in comparison with uh, the modern West and then found wanting, right? So as Deepesh Chakravarti, uh, the Indian uh, historian, reminds us, if that's how we do comparison, then you're always looking at the rest of the world in terms of what he calls lacks and lags. They are lagging behind in time and they lack something. So it's mm -hmm. always a history of absences, what the mm -hmm. other doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So this is one kind of Weberian reflex of looking for functional equivalence in mm -hmm. other societies, right? Uh, and instead of that, uh, 
I think, uh, and this has a political problem to it as well, I think, because this reflects, feeds into uh, the kind of um, uh, right-wing nationalist, culturalist reflex of saying, there is something absolutely specific to uh, Chinese or Indian mm -hmm. civilization and modernity, right? Untouched by anything outside of it. And I think that is as uh, uh, pernicious a reflex as the uh, reflex of universal subsumption. So my idea was to think in terms of entanglements, in terms of entangled histories of modernity, um, following from, uh, as I said, this very um, uh, powerful idea, I think, that Fanon had, that Europe is a creation of its colonies. Mm -hmm. And to think about European history not as being somehow so generous and outside of this history and this historical relationship, but both sides as being part of a relational history. And I think that itself then reconfigures the way in which we problematize certain things because the object of the analysis is not something which we um, circumscribe to begin with, but methodologically it leads us to ask the question, let me draw the boundaries of the field which anthropologists use very much as a, mm -hmm. a discipline, in, uh, as a category in order to uh, come to an understanding of uh, where to do one's ethnography. So it's about sites mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well. But look at, let's look at how these sites are interrelated. Mm -hmm. And so construe the object following the paths that relationships take. These relationships can be asymmetrical, they can be relationships of power, and uh, these can be relationships which increase or decrease over time. So there is nothing constant about uh, uh, these relationships. But I think what you get then is a very different reconfiguration, not only of disciplines, but also about how to study a particular object which you construct to begin with as an object which is constructed relationally. Mm -hmm. you, you've described very well what the, the concept of uh, legal entanglement uh, could actually help us do, both epistemologically and methodologically, by casting uh, where two opposite uh, the type of universalism uh, uh, and the cultural relativism. Mm -hmm. Now, at the normative level, uh, how does it translate uh, this uh, uh, concept of legal entanglement or something else that may take another name? If, normatively speaking, do you think we need to uh, find a third way uh, different from the type of uh, post-racial cosmopolitanism that a lot of political theorists have talked about, especially in the US when Barack Obama was elected, uh, for instance, where there was uh, uh, a lot of publications on the post-racial society in which the US had uh, um, uh, entered, and the, the type of uh, cultural relativism uh, where too much attention is placed on uh, um, positionality or the type of uh, formation of a society of nation states, where too much uh, attention is placed on boundaries, do you see a sort of a normative ideal emerging between these two uh, alternatives, or do you think we should uh, push for one alternative above the other? So I think positionality certainly matters, yeah. right? But uh, what I think is a problem is when um, a positionality is ascribed from the outside. Uh, so if I am invited, uh, which I often used to be, uh, to speak uh, on certain um, uh, topics by saying, oh, we would like to hear an Indian speak on it. And I would say, what makes you assume I will do this from the subject position of an Indian, right? Um, uh, I can take the subject position, uh, which could be a feminist one. I could take a subject position of an anthropologist. So there are multiple subject positions which I can take. And so I think there's a problem with the ascription mm -hmm. of um, uh, these uh, positionalities. Um, 
that's one uh, uh, part of it. The other is, I think, uh, the normative uh, question. The normative question, I think, it's a complicated question, but I think what one does need to um, uh, critically challenge is the idea uh, of a really hypostatized West as the norm. Mm. Um, uh, against which everything is compared, measured, found wanting, uh, should be getting there in time but not yet. Uh, because this is a very paradoxical um, uh, uh, stance. It, On the one hand, it sees the West as the only model of uh, and path of uh, development, so it's a teleological um, uh, kind of thinking. But at the same time, it constantly insists the West is unique. Mm -hmm. So the West cannot both be unique mm -hmm. and to be emulated, mm -hmm. uh, right? So I think there is a, there's a fundamental uh, tension in, in this kind of normativity, which is a historic um, uh, on, uh, on even the Western side. It, it definitely is a historic on the other side. Um, the question of the nation state is a complicated one because I mean, what we have seen at the moment is a resurgence of uh, nation states, mm -hmm. of nationalism, um, partly as a uh, bulwark against uh, globalization. Under COVID, we saw a really strong resurgence of uh, nation state boundaries and states reasserting their authority, not only over their political boundaries with limiting migration, suddenly also within Europe, but also economically uh, supporting their own economies, their own citizens, uh, etc. On the other hand, uh, what we have seen is a resurgence, of course, of uh, right-wing ethno-nationalism, which has been highly problematic for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and yet there is a difference in the histories and trajectories of nationalism in the global south uh, from the ones uh, that we are uh, now, uh, or even earlier, um, witnessed in Europe. Because um, uh, colonial, um, uh, nationalisms which were born of colonialism had an emancipatory element because they were anti-colonial mm -hmm. uh, progressive nationalisms. So I think we really cannot put them all on one mm -hmm. plane and uh, uh, want to get rid of mm -hmm. uh, the nation state um, with that nationalism. I think we need to rethink also uh, a lot of uh, the nation state boundaries in um, uh, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, which are all artifacts of colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to rethink the regions in which um, uh, these nations are positioning and imagining uh, themselves. They, all of these regions also have a uh, colonial uh, and imperial history. So I think there's a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. at many, many levels to, if you like, to decolonize mm -hmm. our imaginations and um, to think of a pluriverse in which we can reconfigure Mm -hmm. many of the boundaries in which we have confined ourselves unnecessarily. Well, thank you very much for, for this uh, great uh, explanation of uh, these very complex issues. Uh, we uh, are grateful to have heard uh, you speak about them and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm.